Well, thank you for returning to this difficult topic. Uh, I'm sure this is one of the closet issues that is not talked about. You've heard the old saying, you don't talk about politics or religion. And I think this word could be added or topic could be added to that conversation as well. In the previous lesson, we talked about natural apologetics. And I provided for you statements from the medical, psychological, and religious communities uh, endorsing and promoting masturbation. And I challenged each one of those. In this lesson here, <clears throat> we're going to focus primarily in on the religious community and their statements and beliefs that masturbation is a acceptable uh, practice. It is not sinful. It is not harmful. But let's set the stage here to understand what I'm about to do. When Jesus was challenged by the Pharisees in John chapter 8, Christ followed the Jewish principle of calling two or three witnesses to validate his statements. In the previous chapter, a number of witnesses in the previous lesson, a number of witnesses from natural apologetics were summoned to testify. From a logical point of view, they bring to bear significant weight for consideration to counter claims that masturbation is innocent and harmless. I sought to debunk those statements that the medical and the psychological and the religious communities brought up. In this video, we will call an additional 10 witnesses from the Bible. The following statements that they make that we'll talk about demand an apologetics, but an apologetics from the Bible. So let's take a look at the first one. The first one is the word masturbation is never mentioned in the Bible. Therefore, it is not a sin. Michael Ross of Focus on the Family, and this is uh, Dobson's group, was asked if masturbation was a sin. His response was, quote, to be honest, the Bible seems to be silent on the issue. He continues, it appears less significant significant to God than most of us, end quote. Another cites, quote, there are no passages in the Bible that discuss this topic directly. Jesus did not give his opinion on masturbation. Although he gave hundreds of instructions to help us govern our lives, he apparently did not consider the topic of human sexuality of great importance, end quote. Can this really be the case? Who created Adam and Eve, male and female? Who gave command to Adam and Eve before the fall and after the fall? And to Noah after the flood to be fruitful and multiply? Who recorded precisely, graphically, and pointedly the sexual sins and punishments of Sodom and Gomorrah? Who wrote about the beauty of love, marriage, and sex in the Song of Solomon? Who wrote about the husband and wife love relationship in Ephesians and Colossians? If God was not interested in human sexuality, he seems to take a lot of time, space, and words on the topic. The argument is because the word masturbation is not used in the scriptures, one can conclude that it is not sin. Would those who hold such a position also hold? that one day Christ will return for his chosen ones with a shout, the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God, as insignificant? Entire theological systems have been developed around a concept represented by a word not found in the Bible. Rapture. We are commanded in 1 John 3.3 3 to purify ourselves because of his imminent return or the rapture. One can critically explore the Bible and find no direct prohibitions against smoking, drinking, or drugs. In fact, no direct statements naming them as sin. But through proper interpretation, one can conclude from Scripture that these items harm the body God has created and defiles the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives within. 
For the conservative, we believe in a monotheistic God who operates in three roles, Father, Son, and Spirit. The word Trinity is not found in the Bible, but the absence of the word does not mean the concept is invalid. There are numerous examples of the Trinity, such as the creation of the world, the baptism of Jesus, the crucifixion of Christ, and your salvation. One cannot argue that because the word masturbation is not found in the Bible and that Christ never addressed that issue, the Bible permits its practice. Second, there are a number of scriptural boundaries that promote masturbation as a means to glorify God. Dale Kaufman writes, what are the boundaries which the word of God set forth for something like masturbation? In what context is the act acceptable and when does it cross the line into a sinful activity? He cites three passages of scripture he calls boundaries that permit and even parade masturbation as a means of glorifying God. Now, this is the gentleman who was the youth pastor up in that large church in Wisconsin that uh, kind of uh, ticked my or cooked my grits that I wrote this book about. He says, here are, uh, how would you respond to this? Scripture is provided. How can it be wrong? The problem with this line of reasoning is misguided hermeneutics and bending interpretation rules to support a conclusion. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. There are two fundamental concepts which must be followed to reach the proper interpretation. First, someone studying the Bible must understand that God's revelation is progressive in nature. God did not reveal his entire program, excuse me, God did not reveal his entire program. <clears throat> Through increments, God unveiled what man needed to know or what man was able to comprehend and obey. The Bible did not fall from heaven at all in one piece. From Moses to John, its composition took about 16 centuries, during which time the divine truth was manifested with increasing clarity. The appearance of the sun makes an excellent illustration of this. Truth dawned approaches progressively. The, then the sun burst forth on the horizon gradually, but steadily mounting to its zenith, while its light steals nearer and nearer to illuminate the whole landscape. A second fundamental concept which must be followed to reach the proper interpretation is a latter revelation cannot contradict a previous revelation. Stated differently, there is complete unity in the scriptures. Subsequent revelation usually amplifies or clarifies earlier revelation but never opposes when scriptures are made to say something that were they were not intended usually poor or lazy hermeneutics are applied coffin wants us to believe that masturbation is permissible because of the citation of three bible passages and he quotes first corinthians 6 19 through 20 philippians 4 8 and colossians 3 17. The New Testament often amplifies on previous Old Testament revelation. What earlier revelation hinted that masturbation was acceptable? What is a solid procedure that guarantees the right interpretation and understanding of, of the passage in harmony with the total uh, Bible? Well, you must examine the verse within the paragraph. Then the paragraph dwells within a chapter. The chapter lives within the book that reflects the author's intention, purpose, and design. The book resides within a testament, old or new. The testament must live harmoniously with the entire revelation. Third, guilt and shame are the byproducts of an oversensitive religious community. Scruples about masturbation, James Dobson wrote, 
involve some oversensitive, pious young people in the danger of suicide. James Dobson, the noted Christian psychologist, responds saying, so what should parents say to their children about the subject? My advice is to say nothing after puberty has occur, occurred. You will only cause embarrassment and discomfort. From an article entitled Masturbation in the Bible, the, the writer records how psychology responds to guilt. Physiologically, there seems to be no harm in masturbating, though most psychology textbook writers admit that associated guilt and shame affect millions, especially during adolescence. This guilt is usually blamed on strict and legalistic religious upbringing and Victorian prudishness about sex. Are guilt and shame really byproducts of an oversensitive religious community? Can guilt and shame be reproduced to mere, can be reduced to mere manipulation? Or are we willing to see the purpose of and the distinction between guilt and shame? A biblical definition of guilt is a legal or judicial term that implies criminal responsibility in the eyes of a court of law, whether human or divine. There are three Greek words grouping three Greek word groupings that provide helpful insight on the concept. The first grouping means the grounds, cause, or reason, charge, or motive for the guilt. The second grouping means to bring to light, expose, set forth, convict, convince, and provide evidence. The third grouping means liability, deserving of a penalty, in keeping with the charge and evidence. Guilt, therefore, is exposing someone's actions, identifying the reasons, and assessing an appropriate punishment to restore the offender to God and his fellow man. Guilt is a direct result of sinful actions. The Holy Spirit convicts of sin, and the human mind interacts with this, uh, with this convicting work to produce guilt. People can be used by God to produce guilt in the lives of others using the word of God for that sole purpose of restoration. Now, on the other hand, shame is the feeling someone experiences because of another who has mistreated him or, and the conflict remains unresolved. There's only one Greek word for shame, which means disgrace or dishonor. In classical Greek lighting, writing, shame carries the idea of ugly or disfigured. In the New Testament, the word is prom, uh, prominently used in uh, conjunction with God's judgment upon his enemies. Biblical characters who dealt with shame were Joseph, Daniel, and our Lord. So what are we to conclude? Guilt is not the byproduct of an oversensitive religious community. It is not solely attributed to strict or legalistic religious upbringing or Victorian prudishness. It is a God-given barometer that accurately describes and diagnoses one's spiritual, mental, and emotional well-being. Next, morality is not restricted to definition or practice by the Bible alone. Liberal Christians typically do not base their moral code solely on the Bible. They integrate findings of science, medicine, etc., including research into human sexuality. Most sexuality and mental health professionals have concluded that masturbation is normal and healthy. This argument reflects the problem of source. All truth is not God's truth. Bill Good, former executive director of the National Association of Neuthetic Counselors, who is now present with the Lord, expounds on the misnomer of all truth is God's truth. Quote, rather than saying all truth is God's truth and bringing all kinds of suppositions and theories into the church, it is time we looked at the source that some are calling truth. End quote. What are the sources of truth people rely upon? There is empirical truth or discoveries from human studies. This would include knowledge gained by laboratory and other testing. This may prove helpful, but what is proven is called truth or fact today 
may be proven wrong tomorrow. Although empirical data may be of great benefit, we can never be sure about it or equal with it with revelation or equate it with revelation. One medical doctor said he was told in his last year that 50% of what is taught to you as fact today will be proven wrong in six to 10 years. And no one knows which 50% that is. A more recent graduate of medical school spoke up and said, Today, the time interval for changing those things we once called fact is from one to three years. Another source of knowledge is theories and opinions produced by reason. Now, reason is a gift of God, but reason is affected by sin. Apart from the Bible, no one can have absolute certainty that he or she is reasoning correctly. Whatever the source of knowledge coming from reason it has limitations. The natural mind cannot bridge the span between natural and supernatural. Reason works with the data available. If one has accurate data, the natural mind is suspect in reaching the right conclusions. Why? The deceitful nature mind, the deceitful nature mind, seeking to study the deceitful nature mind, personality and habits is bound to come short. In other words, the deceitful mind or the natural man seeking to understand the natural mind and personality and habits of another is bound to come short. So morality must be bound by definition and practice to the Bible alone. The word of God is the only infallible rule for faith and practice. It is inspired. It is all sufficient to teach, reprove, correct, and train. God made us essential beings, the next argument they propose. Masturbation brings pleasure. God's intention of enjoying our sensuality finds its fulfillment in masturbation. We addressed a form of this reasoning in the previous lecture with natural apologetics. I would like to consider a second line of reasoning. The premise is God designed us to enjoy pleasure. In our previous argument, we proposed God calls us to obedience. We are enjoined by Paul to be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. The Christian is called to obedience, and he is called to imitating Christ. So what would this look like instead of a life of pleasure? To imitate Jesus, we must walk like Jesus. Jesus denied the flesh and its pleasures. When tempted with hunger, he refused to enjoy the pleasures of turning stone into bread. He told his disciples that the pleasures of home and family were foreign to him. He denied the pleasures of heaven and took on the form and fashion of a man. He absorbed the pain and suffering of crucifixion crucifixion and did not flee from the will of God. Our culture and its influence have proclaimed the search for and enjoyment of pleasure and avoidance of long-term gratification. Yet the chief end of man is to worship God, enjoy him forever, and to glorify him, not self. This is going to be a two-part lesson. Uh, we will pick up the last five religious points and apply biblical uh, apologetics to that in the next lecture. I hope you come back. I hope you are finding this helpful. You know, if you are, leave me a comment. You know, sometimes when you broadcast, you're talking to a microphone and you hope people are listening. The comments provide encouragement. Thanks so much.